Welcome to the third webinar organized by the Size Vacuum Technology Division. Today we will put into practice the contents of the last webinar, exploiting a real vacuum system in our laboratories. We will go through all the steps required for achieving ultra-high vacuum conditions in our test system, starting from its setup, the choice of the pumping system, and some good practices to keep in mind when targeting the 10 minus 10 millibar range. In particular, we will see how the system has been assembled with its components, how to perform a helium leak test with the QMS, preparing the system and performing the backout, the neg pump activation, and finally, we will have a look at the base pressure and how an RGA spectrum looks like in UHV. My name is Fabrizio Siviero. I work as a senior scientist at the Vacuum Technology Development Lab. Together with me, my colleague Luciano Caruso, specialized technician with 25 years experience in UHV systems. This is one of the labs of the Size Vacuum System Development Lab. Here we study and characterize non-evaporable getter pumps. And we investigate the pump down of UHV systems with different pumping configurations. As stated, our experiments will involve a real system to be set up step by step. This is the vessel we are going to use. It is a stainless steel 304L chamber. The system is pumped by a turbo molecular pump with a nominal pumping speed of 260 liters per second for nitrogen. The pump can be isolated by an all-metal gate valve. In UHV, this kind of valves should be always preferred against valves with elastomer sealing, which outgas air and water for a rather long time after venting and cannot be baked at more than 150 degrees. The turbo molecular pump is backed by a dry pump, a scroll in this case. To keep the system clean, a dry pump is clearly preferable. A Pirani gauge provides a measurement of the four-line pressure. The Bialdalpert gauge reads the pressure in the system, while a quadruple mass spectrometer is used to analyze the atmosphere composition. All the instruments have been grouped in a rack, and all the components like pumps, valves, gauges, the QMS, thermocouples are interfaced with the PC so that we acquire all the signals and we run everything from here, backout included. We have prepared a volume in which an extra pump will be assembled. The pump we are going to use for our test is a new model that is going to be released on the market. It is the Nextor Z500. As you have already learned, it is based on the novel ZAW alloy providing nearly 600 liters per second for hydrogen. Therefore, even though the footprint and shape do not change with respect to its sister, that is the Nextor D500, this pump is able to deliver a higher pumping speed for hydrogen for a better final pressure. This is the pump controller, the Neck Power Mini. It is a compact and light instrument, easy to use, but featuring all the basic functions needed to control an egg pump. You can set a voltage ramp, the duration of the activation, and it provides a thermocouple reading. Okay, it's time to assemble the next pump on the system. First, we remove the magnets in view of the backout, as we will explain later. All the flanges have been tightened and the chamber is ready for pump down. Here you can see a real-time plot of the pressure reading of the Pirani gauge. This is the control panel of the bench. We can switch on and off pumps. This is the backing pump. This is the TMP. We can read pressures. We can control gas supply lines to perform pumping speed tests. Now we start the backing pump and open the valves to evacuate the vessel. You can see the pressure decreasing. We wait for the pressure to reach the 10 to the minus 2 torr range and we switch on the turbo molecular pump. After a while, we can turn the bioadapter gauge on. We wait for the system to achieve a base pressure in the low 10 to the minus 6 torr. 
let's perform a leak check before preparing the system for the backout. We turn on the QMS and let it stabilize. Many QMS have a leak check mode, monitoring the helium signal at mass 4. We spray helium from this needle close to the ceilings and the feed throughs. It is advisable to start from the top of the vacuum system since helium moves up in ambient atmosphere and there's the risk of getting confused about the location of a possible leak. Always leave some time in between one component and the other. During all the operation, the signal is stable and does not rise, so everything looks okay. We can prepare the vessel for the backout. There are many ways of heating a vessel, for example by an oven and heating elements. It's very easy to prepare the system once that you have the oven, and it provides very uniform temperature. On the other hand, you must design it from the beginning, at the very early stages of the system design. Then it's rather expensive and poses practical constraints on the bench dimensions. For example, if we want to assemble something on the vessel, it must fit the oven. Another possibility is using a custom heating jackets. They are effective and easy to assemble, but they can be quite expensive. Clearly, it depends on the system purpose if the cost is acceptable or not. Of course, you cannot change the system shape once prepared the jackets. The most flexible and economic way of heating a chamber is using heating tapes. You can do whatever you want, but it depends on you whether the chamber will be heated up in a uniform way or not. You must assemble them with care, with equal spacing and taking into account the mass to be heated. There are many types of tapes with different power and material. The main characteristics that we search in heating tapes are the maximum working temperature and the ability to withstand the heating cycles without becoming too rigid or cracking or having a risk of short circuits. Let's prepare the system for the backout. We have removed the magnets from the ion pump to preserve them from possible overheating and allow a better ion pump degassing. As for all next door pumps, in the case the chamber temperature does not exceed 150 degrees, the magnets can be left plugged. If the system goes to higher temperature, the magnets have to be removed. The cables we do provide with the pump are high temperature rated and radiation resistant up to 1 gigarad. They can withstand temperatures as high as 250 degrees C. Anyway, don't forget that cables must not be assembled or disassembled at a temperature higher than 50 degrees C. We place a thermocouple in the chamber and we fix it with a special metallic heat-resistant adhesive tape. Place the tip not directly behind the heater since it would bring a significant overestimation of the vessel temperature. Let's fix the heater on the chamber for the backout. The tape should be set as tight as possible at regular spacing. Don't forget the flanges. The heaters can be fastened with metallic wires, special tape or aluminum foil. Once fixed the heating tapes, the vessel is covered with aluminum foils to get as uniform as possible temperature and increase the heating efficiency. Indeed, the stainless steel is a rather poor heat conductor. In order to control the temperature, it is recommended to use PID controllers. We set 150 degrees as backout temperature. We start the backout and monitor temperature on the screen. The temperature rises together with pressure. Then we reach the set point and keep it for two days. When the heaters are turned off, the pressure follows immediately. Let's enlarge the scale and follow the first two hours of cooling. When the vessel is still at nearly 70 degrees C, the pressure is 2 to the minus 9 torr. When temperature is below 50 degrees, we uncover the ion pump. We assemble the magnets and connect the cables. It is important not to assemble or disassemble the cables at higher temperature to avoid the risk of causing a leakage in the feed-through. 
we already achieved a pressure of uh, 1.5 10 to the minus 9 torr. The bench is still a bit warm, but now it is time to activate the neck pump. Let us first uh, turn on the ion pump for a while to further clean it. The sputter ion pump is powered with the SIP power. The pressure slightly rises, then goes down again. We switch off the ion pump, then set up the NEG activation parameters. The NEG Power Mini allows to adjust the activation parameters as per user's need. Two important parameters are the T-Rise and T-Hold. T-Rise is the voltage ramp duration. We set 30 minutes. This means that the voltage will be gradually increased and within 30 minutes the NEG Mini will deliver the full power to the pump. T-Hold is the time interval the full power has to be kept, that is the activation time. A standard activation runs in one hour, so we can set 60 minutes. Let's start. The pressure rises little by little. A good practice for all neck pumps is to gradually increase the activation voltage up to the nominal value. This will allow the getter material to steadily reach the full activation temperature, having a smooth outgassing trend throughout the process. This will also reduce the initial outgassing given by the heater of the pump itself. As the temperature increases, physiosorbed species are released according to their desorption energy. After the main peak caused by physisorbed species, the pressure drops, then rises again until we reach a plateau, due to the hydrogen coming out of the getter. After our T-rise plus T-hold time interval, that is 90 minutes, the activation stops automatically. The pressure immediately starts to decrease, since hydrogen is pumped again by the neg material cooling down quickly. Here we can see a summary of the different phases of the activation process that we had the opportunity of following in real time. The morning after, we achieved a pressure of 1.7 to the minus 10 torr. If we turn on the QMS, it is likely that pressure will rise a bit. The QMS spectrum shows uh, hydrogen followed by water, which is likely outgassed by the QMS surroundings, then methane, CO, and CO2. It is interesting to see what happens in case of a second activation process without venting of the chamber. The peak associated to physisorbed species is not present, and the pressure evolution is due to hydrogen alone. This plot compares the first and the second activation processes. You can see that the plateau is the same, but the part related to the desorption of physisorbed species is missing. That's all for today. In the next webinar, we will have a deeper insight into the typical spectra of UHV systems. Thank you and stay with us.